They won. They won all the supply side fights. They privatized everything they could be privatized. Yeah. They deregulated everything they could deregulate. And now here we are, and it's like, what is your project? The only project they have left is to cut corporate taxes. There's yeah. nothing left for them to do. They have picked every cherry off the tree, and it stands there bare. My argument is, is that the reason why the right is so weak today is because, because they, they won. won. <laughs> it's because they won. Welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. I think it's fair to say that Donald Trump confuses a lot of people. Maybe confuses is a weird word, but 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 bear with me here. I think he confuses people because it doesn't make sense that he's able to do what he does. And he doesn't fit into a lot of the preconceived notions people have about what a politician is and particularly what a conservative is. You've seen this rhetoric around him from the very first moment that he comes down the escalator through after winning the election, through all the way through that first year of all kinds of people wrestling with what is Donald Trump political? Is he really a conservative? He's not really a conservative. You see conservatives trying to write him out of the conservative movement. The never Trumpers saying, no, 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 you don't understand. We're the good conservatives. We're the people who have these principles. That guy over there, Donald Trump, who just happens to helm the conservative coalition in America, he's just an accident. He's a fluke. He has nothing to do with us. And you see a lot of analysts, writers, observers wrestling with this all the time. And it feels a lot of times like they're trying to jam this square peg into a round hole to make sense of who Donald Trump is. So today I'm going to talk to someone who has made sense of Donald Trump from the very beginning, who's got an entire theory, a total apparatus for understanding conservatism stretching back through the centuries in which Donald Trump makes perfect sense. If you read his book about conservatism that stretches all the way back to Edmund Burke, who I'll talk about in a second, you already knew that Donald Trump was conservative. You understood why he was a conservative. Corey Robbins is a professor of political science, and he's someone who wrote this book called The Reactionary Mind uh, about conservatism. Originally, it was about conservatism from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin, which was kind of a cheeky title, like, oh, Sarah Palin, Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke, this elevated philosopher, Sarah Palin, this ridiculous figure. The point of the subtitle is, no, 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 there, that, 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 there's a through line there. Then he reissued the book with the subtitle, Edmund Burke to Donald Trump. And he's a scholar. He's a He does close readings of texts. And he talks about Edmund Burke, who's someone that gets invoked more than he gets read and thought about as the sort of father of modern conservatism, someone who opposed the French Revolution, who basically was a kind of upstanding dude who just liked things to be orderly. Corey Robin shows that's not really the case with Edmund Burke. In fact, he was kind of more Trumpian than anyone remembers. That really he liked to kind of F shit up, if that makes sense. Can I say that on the podcast? I think I can say that on the podcast. So Corey Robin's point is that conservatism from the very beginning hasn't been about limited government, hasn't been about individual liberty, hasn't been about freedom, hasn't been about restraint, hasn't been about prudential approaches to risk. It's been about fundamental opposition to movements that seek to restructure who has power in a society, particularly from the bottom up. It has been a reaction to movements of liberation that seek to undo hierarchy. And if you understand conservatism in that way, if you go all the way back and then race all the way forward and you look at conservatism from Edmund Burke and the French Revolution to the slaveholding class in the South during the Civil War, up through the modern Republican Party, up through Richard Nixon, up through Ronald Reagan, up to Donald Trump, what you see is continuity. You see a very clear picture of what the movement is, what its ideological precepts are, what its political position is, and why Donald Trump makes absolutely perfect sense as a conservative. Also, getting inside Corey's head, I think, makes a lot of sense of this political moment about whether conservatism is actually strong right now, or as he argues, weirdly weak. It also helps make sense of the resistance to that movement, what it needs to do, what it's failing to do now, and this is a really unique perspective. What I really like about Corey is he is approaching the moment we live in with this vast and deep historical knowledge. This is a guy who's taken the time to sit down and read page after page, chapter after chapter, book after book of a long line of thinkers that allows him to offer unique and penetrating insights on a man I don't think any of us would really call a thinker per se, the current president of the United States.
So here's why I think this is interesting, what you're, you're writing on conservatism. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. There's this thing that happens where Donald Trump gets elected, where a lot of people write their pieces about, like, I was wrong about conservatism, or is Donald Trump a conservative? And my reading of your book, Reactionary Mind, and there's a new version of it out with a part on Donald Trump, is that he slots in perfectly to what you had already established before Donald Trump. So, like, what was your theory such that Donald Trump was able to fit into it? Well, so the first thing is the idea that conservatism is fundamentally reactionary, that it is hostile, first and foremost, to the emancipation of the subordinates of society. Who those subordinates are changes across time. Most recently, it was black people and women. In that sense, Donald Trump fits very much with the patterns of reaction on the right that we've seen uh, going back, well, going back to the very beginning, but most recently going back to the 1960s and the 1970s. But what's the beginning? Because one of the things I love about the book is that it identifies a point at which conservatism in the sort of modern sense we think of of it comes to be born, which is that it can't come to be born until there's this real movement against those hierarchies. Yeah. So the beginning is the French Revolution. That's the first great democratic revolution that seeks to emancipate a class of people and uh, who are at the bottom of society who say, we have the right to govern ourselves. We are opposed to the fact of subordination. And the great first great thinker on the right is Edmund Burke. Um, And I argue that he's been consistently misunderstood by a lot of people. The typical Burke that you get and you learn about in your college classes and on the op-ed pages of the New York Times is uh, somebody who was uh, traditional and cared about prudential reasoning, who was against extravagance, who was against ideology. We always say, I feel like the shortcut for this is always small C conservative. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that's like the, that's the weird cliche about it. It's like, oh, he's a small C conservative. And it's, 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 it's almost meant to be not just philosophical, but just like, won't like spend more than he has. And like wants things to be in their proper place, like a kind of prim and. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and that's the way he's often narrated. And what I did was to go back and I did this crazy thing of actually reading him and found that he was anything but that. Hella crazy. Yeah. Like very, soup, like, no, but like super really into blood and guts. Yeah. Real into violence, real into disorder, actually. Right. Very like, much so. He saw that all those things that you just mentioned as part of a political project, he thought that this was what was necessary in order to counter this cataclysm that he saw developing in Europe, in France, which he thought was continental. He thought it was a civilizational crisis. So that's the really important thing about conservatism is that it is a defense of hierarchy. But we've had defenses of hierarchy going back to Plato and Aristotle. There's nothing new about that. It's the way they defend hierarchy in this extravagant um, language that very often mimics in a really unsettling way the very revolution that it's opposing. And, and more specifically, and here's this emotional core of the book that, that connects to our own times, speaks to loss. You talk about this a lot, right? So like, if you have privileges, if you're on top of a hierarchy, and then from one day to the next, you're on the bottom of it, that's a loss. It's like an actual loss. And that feels terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and the feeling of that is essentially the emotional core of what you say conservatism is. Absolutely. And just to add one part to that, they connect that feeling of loss, which I think is a fairly universal feeling. Absolutely. Um, People up and down the social order, as we are seeing right now and have seen, um, can experience real losses. And I think the left makes a big mistake when it tries to dismiss that or say they're not real or they're a figment of people's imagination. You wouldn't have a right if that experience That's weren't exactly. real. And you see it, you see it all, you see it in like Dunkin' Donuts conversations around the Me Too movement, mm. <laughs> right? You see, you know, over here men being like, I don't know, this is, and these are not men who in a broad sense are elites, no. in a broad sense have like huge amounts of privilege, right? right. Might even be men of color or, or poor men of color, but this, well, you know, I don't know, it just feels like it's, it's going too far. You can't say anything anymore. You can't say anything anymore. And it's like, you can't say anything anymore is like the perfect encapsulation of the sensation of loss. Yeah. And it and it shows that the, what conservatism has been always very good at is tapping into 
this sort of democracy of loss. And it, it's it, a great it, phrase. it does begin at a very elite level. And I think it's important always to hold on to this. It doesn't bubble up from the bottom. It begins at the top. The case that I always was struck by are the slaveholders in the South. Um, the way they were able to thread that needle. I mean, slaveholders were a fairly exclusive category. You know, all white men were not they were slaveholders. Tiny. They were a tiny percentage of the of Southern yeah. uh, whites. But the genius of the slavehold, the master class, was to be able to connect their experience at the very highest reaches of power in society with people who were at the very, not quite at the total bottom, which were slaves, but white people who were really uh, had no chance of being slaveholders themselves. But it was really John C. Calhoun, who was the vice president under Andrew Jackson and the, the real theoretician of the Old South, who said, ultimately, it's the privilege of a white skin. I mean, this is long before W. He just comes out and says it. He, he says knows it. it. They he know what it. they're doing. He, he says it very clearly. He says, with in our society, the rich and the poor are really white and black. And it's enough to have a white skin to make you part of the master class. So you are, we are all in this together. And so then when you start divesting people, white people, of those privileges, you're taking something away from them. So I, I wanted to do this is sort of like a prologue there because we sort of started with Donald Trump. Like, so why can you slot him into this tradition where other people didn't? So to come back around right now that you've got that as a kind of groundwork. So if you say, well, no, conservatism is about um, – Oh, I'm I'm conservative. I don't cheat on my wife, and um, I always balance my books, and uh, I don't take undue risks. Like, which is the way that it weirdly gets characterized, like as if that's what Edmund Burke was all about, and that's right. a tradition. Like, well, yeah, Donald Trump makes no sense because he has none of those qualities, right. at all. But if you see a reaction to loss, and crucially the vision of the world is zero sum because those two ideas are so inextricably brown, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're true. Like, white disposition in the South post-Civil War was zero sum. Like, you give up that land. Give up those possessions. That's coming out of your pocket. But if you look at it as the experience of loss and the view of the world is zero sum, which is your theory, well, then, like, you just described Donald Trump. Yeah. There's a difference. I mean, there's a lot of differences. But, yes, I think that's, that's the ground zero of which... Donald Trump is part of the right uh, and is part of a long tradition and is reacting to it and really reflects and, and particularly, you know, you, you mentioned all of those things about Trump that liberals go crazy about his absolute indifference to fact and to truth, his complete willingness to contradict himself with with without a hint of shame or embarrassment. <laughs> and we and I include myself. We sit there and it's. It's mind boggling. And, and you try to wrap your mind and you think he's he signed his death every night I, on your network. They're saying he's signing, you know, he's signing his death warrant and and it, it, it doesn't affect him. And there's a reason for that. It's not about Trump and it's not uh, about our moment. It's that the whole apparatus of conservatism has always been oriented around that hostility to reason, that hostility to factual fidelity because that was the whole apparatus of counter-revolutionary thought. That we are going to turn the world the way it is now. We're going to turn it back up. Mm. You know, you turned it upside down. We're going to turn it right back up. And so there's always been a real hostility to the world as it is. No, we, the right, are going to imagine a different world and create it. I mean, Karl Rove, he said that. Remember right. those, that famous interview? You know, you journalists. Reality-based community. Right. right you yes. describe it. We, we create the world uh, as it will be. And so there's always been a hostility to factuality and to the world as it is. And Trump is kind of just the vulgarized, almost id version of that. So then that gets to this question of, like, the this is not normal question. Yeah. Right? And I, I, I am torn on this question, right? Yeah. So at one level, I want to say we underplay at our peril the continuity between, say, George W. Bush and Donald Trump, the ideological affinity between Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and Donald Trump, that there's, a, there's continuity there, mm -hmm. um, important continuity. And in fact, you know, I, I will sometimes do this riff for people that are younger where I'll say— you weren't around then or you were too young, but like we had this guy back in the day who like won all those red counties and like 
was looked down upon by like the elitist liberals in like the blue dots on the coasts who said he was like an incurious dolt who was not up to the job and only who he was because of his father's name. And we got called like unpatriotic and then he was a total disaster. It turned out we were right. And like, that's the last guy. That's George W. Bush, right? right. Like, <laughs> and that's, I mean, all those same scripts. Right. So at one level, like there's this continuity there you want to talk about. But then at the same time, it's like it drives me a little crazy. A certain portion of the left. Me. Yes. <laughs> people like me. <laughs> people like you who, who there's a certain part in the left that seems to me like a little weirdly fixated on this continuity question in sacrifice of things that we see on their face that really are genuinely anomalous yeah. and, and distinct and abnormal. Yeah. There are things that are anomalous about Trump. And I, I think we ought to recognize them. Unfortunately, I tend to think we fixate on the things that we call anomalous but are, in fact, very continuous. So, for instance, the hostility to reason and the hostility to fact-based, you know, that is very continuous with George W. Bush. There's That I don't see as new. But what I do think is new and what I talk about in the book is um, that for many, many years, uh, the kind of the racial dog whistles that we set, you know, that really was enough to bridge the kind of gap between the elites and the masses of the right. Um, you know, you did it with a wink, uh, a nod and a wink. And it's become very clear at some point that that was no longer the case, that you needed more in order to rally the base. And, and, and Trump is that more. But the question is, what does that tell us? And I think what that tells us is that conservatism is actually weaker than it has ever been. And I, I, I know this is a very counterintuitive idea. It seems to go against everything we uh, believe. And we I mean, it's counterintuitive, although sort of surprisingly comforting. Yeah. And I don't mean it as comforting um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because Be we, like, no, no, you, we will die in a nuclear <laughs> war born of the weakness <laughs> of conservatism. Well, it's true. You know, weak movements can be dangerous. That's movements. my point. Yeah, exactly. But I do think that um, all the things that we I mean, uh, you know, Reagan, it was enough to go to Neshoba County and just talk about states' rights. Um, that but was Neshoba County is in Mississippi where yeah. the three civil rights workers have been murdered that, you know, make up the film of uh, the Mississippi burning. Exactly. And that's where Reagan launches his 1980 presidential campaign. Right. It was a very deliberate move. He knew you know, exactly what he was doing. Um, and but at some point that became not enough. And the reason it becomes not enough, and you see this, I mean, go back to Nixon, look at those presidential electoral returns, right? Nixon wins re-election with 64, 65% of the vote. Reagan wins re-election morning in America with 58% of the vote. George W. Bush wins re-election with 52% of the vote. It's going down. Or look at George W. Bush, you know, his tax cuts. Now, those tax cuts happened before 9-11. People forget that. Yep. That was before 9-11. Yep. And he got something like 67 votes, 66 votes uh, for those tax cuts. He didn't have to use reconciliation for his tax cuts. Right. Trump got them by the – it wasn't even Trump. It was, of course, McConnell and Ryan. They got them by the skin of their teeth. So I, th I think there's lots of different measures we could look at electorally, uh, public opinion-wise – institution building. The radical right, the Republican right that was began, you know, really with Barry Goldwater, they built these institutions, these very powerful sort of policy electoral apparatuses, the Christian right, you know, all those think tanks in DC, yep. you know, the Heritage Foundation, all that kind of stuff. They built that infrastructure that has been able to deliver it for them over and over and over again. What infrastructure did Don, has Donald Trump or the contemporary Republican Party manage or the cons conservative movement managed to build that's comparable? I don't I don't see it. OK, so that brings us. So there's two trends, right, sort of identifying here. So this this kind of weakness. Right. So apex of strength in, in 80 and Reagan and and weakening down to the 46 percent that Donald Trump wins to get him elected president with three million fewer votes than his opponent, yeah. which is remarkable. At the same time, as that strength comes down, the the whisper becoming a shout, right? The the dog whistle becoming a human yeah. <laughs> exhortation. There's an ideological project that Reagan embodies, where we draw the lines between what the market does and what the state does, and it is part of a global revolution that's represented by various figures. Um, from Deng Xiaoping in China uh, to Margaret Thatcher in Britain to um, Pinochet in Chile. Right. 
It's called a lot of things, neoliberalism, etc. But there's a revolution that happens right around that period during a crisis for global capitalism in which profits have gone down, in which you have high levels of inflation and stagnation. And there's a series of things that the right says that are part of this ideological project. Like Margaret Thatcher says, like, the British state shouldn't be running a coal mining operation. Yeah. Like, why are we doing that? That's right. something the market should do. And that's not like a ridiculous view. Yeah, right. <laughs> That intellectual project won and is now bankrupt. Yeah. That like there's nothing left. Like they won. They privatized everything they could be privatized. Yeah. They deregulated everything they could deregulate. And now here we are. And it's like, what is your project? The only project they have left is to cut corporate taxes. There's yeah. nothing left for them to do. They have picked every cherry off the tree, and it stands there bare. Yeah. And I, I that's, I mean, that's exactly my argument. Is is that the reason why the right is so weak today? It's because, because they, they won. won. <laughs> it's because they won. I mean, that's really important for people to, I mean, especially people who, you know, are newer to like, you know, that Trump was their, sort of their awakening to this, this monster on the right. If you look back at what was the project, and it's not just about economics, but that was a huge one. And that really goes back to the New Deal. I mean, they all those arguments you're talking about were yes. all forged in the 1930s and the 1940s. Kim Phillips finds great book, Invisible yes. Hands, Fantastic. Sort of intellectual history of this, which is Fantastic. great. Yeah. But they also won, I would argue, to a large degree on the second phase of the project, which is the black freedom struggle. We forget, you know, what was the originating demand of the black freedom struggle? Desegregation. Yep. And, uh, you know, those vicious, vicious, violent battles. Read Rick Perlstein's book on Nixonland. Yep. And you you see, I mean, every day it was a bombing. It was, you know, it was just in Boston with the busing battles. You know, really, where is your kid going to school? Who is sitting next to your kid at school? These were very intimate questions. And again, the right one that battle. But then that can, that brings us to this question about kind of white identity grievance, right? Because yeah. what we are seeing is the sort of economic agenda is is just bankrupt at this point. And one of the things we see with Trump is just like sort of giving up on that rhetorically and really embracing just mm -hmm. the white racial grievance politics. Yeah. Which makes you wonder about what the future of Trump and Trumpian conservatism looks like. Alex Perrine wrote this really scary piece where he basically says the future of college Republicans are going to be KKK people. Right. Like the like the future is going to be Richard Spencer's and white nationalists. That is the kind of people that is the going to be the vanguard of young conservative Republican politics. Right. I disagree with that. And I think it's because look at what has happened to Richard Spencer. He has had to give up his college tour. I, I listened to it. It was a 25 minute Facebook announcement wow, you, or YouTube. Man, I, yeah, you, you, glutton for punishment. No, you got to you got to pay attention to the. Oh, you know, that guy. The, I, I've, I've had as much Richard Spencer content for nine lifetimes. I'm sure this you point. have. I'm sure. No, I'm sure you have. But what was interesting there was he talked about the Antifa, you know, these leftists who are anti-racist. And he said, you know, they're violent and you know, we just wanted to have fun. And, you know, I wanted to talk about idea. And he, and it's just very clear that Whatever his ideas and his politics are, the, the kind of metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, that used to be in the right is just... It's <laughs> That's a bizarre and perverse thing to say, though. You're, you're saying, like, you're basically saying, like, he's no Maestra, he's no Pinochet. Yeah, I, I am saying that. <laughs> right, well, which is... That's, but I'm also saying... But he's also no... He's, no, good, <laughs> he's no shock troops, like, you know, of, of the sort well, of thing. Well, thank that, God. You know, at, I'm not complaining. I'm, I, but, but, but this is when I say they're weak. This is what I'm talking about. Well, but wait, hold on a second. Let's zoom in on that because the weak that 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 is equating weakness with essentially willingness to do violence. I mean, that's a, that's equating weakness well, and strength okay. with that. So, but that's important to you know. I mean, remember this is this is what we were told was the brave new future of the right was that that willingness. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, compared to what we saw. Forget Pinochet and all in the 1960s with the white supremacist right. What they were willing to do, it's actually quite different. I mean, this you know, it's 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 not the same. It's interesting you say that because it reminds me of something a, a Turkish sort of dissident said to me after Trump's election that I've always thought of. She says, you know, because there was all this question, right? Like, or do we just elect our own Erdogan? Right? Yeah. Is this an authority? She said, you know, Erdogan is a hard man. He did time in prison. Yeah, he's been a dissident on the wrong side of the state. Vladimir Putin is a hard man. Vladimir Putin is, has probably killed people. He's had people killed. Um, Donald Trump's a soft man. 
And he basically it was like, this is not the guy with the M E T T L E medal yeah. to do the kinds of things that these other people in the comparison set that you're worried about have done. And I, and let me say two things about that. Number one, Donald Trump made that very clear in his various campaign statements. So all that stuff, we're going to take the oil that got people really scared and all the America first. If you actually read just the kind of the next sentence that comes after that, how does he propose to do any of that stuff? It's always we're going to take them to the world court. We're going to we're going to we're going to slap a, a, a this on them. It, there's never I mean, there's this kind of ambient well, violence bomb, bomb the shit out of them. For the most part, it's these kind of very legalistic maneuver. I mean, this is a guy, right. according to David K. Johnston, he's you know, the thing this the one thing this guy knows how to do is file a lawsuit. Is sue and be sued. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Like, exactly. like 4,000 lawsuits he was a part of. And I mean, so who who does that? That's not Erdogan. You know, that's not right, Putin. Right, that's right, somebody right. who comes from the New York State real estate market. <laughs> and so that's the one thing I would say. But let me say one other thing. Was like, let's take this out of the realm of, of violence. Right. Let's just talk about it in terms of kind of political metal, kind of the will to power. Someone like Ronald Reagan, who was, you know, always underestimated by, like, this is a guy who worked his way through those arguments. You know, it's, yes. he, it's not that he was such a smart man. No. He had to work his way into those positions. And they could came. tell you them because he felt it in his bones. Absolutely. The fact that Trump, yeah. you know, kind of saddles into this thing without any, you know, and in a way, this is the way he's like Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan didn't have to work his way into these arguments. They were handed to him on a silver platter. Um, and I, so I think Trump in that sense is very uh, representative of the right as a whole, which is at the ones who have conviction, like Paul Ryan, it's a conviction of inheritance. Reagan built those ideas. He really had to work at them. And I think that's, you know, the mm. kind of disciplinary crucible by which you come to those ideas in the 1950s and the 1960s, you know, when you're the intellectual minority. Right. When you're in opposition. I mean, when you're in opposition. The, here's my worst fear. When you look at the center left, they are in retreat. They are being destroyed. It's like watching an army bayoneted yeah. as they fall back. Yeah. If you look at the center left in the Netherlands and in France and in Italy, yeah. uh, they, they're wiped out. They're yeah. uh, essentially on their way to extinction. Germany, yeah. Germany as well. Yeah. That basically the vacuum will be filled by essentially some 21st century version of fascism, of racial grievance as a unifying uh, attack that instead embraces something like Heronvolk democracy, the, the 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 Polish right, which is giving out big, cutting checks to every family that has kids. This kind of embrace of of a kind of social democratic state for people like us. Yeah, that's my fear. And Steve Bannon's going around Europe, basically saying the future belongs to us. Yeah, pun intended. You argue for sovereignty, and they call you a nativist. You argue for your freedom, and they call you a xenophobe. You argue for your country and they call you a racist. But the days of that smear are over. Let them call you xenophobes. Let them call you nativists. Wear it as a badge of honor. I don't see Bannon's, you know, lap around Europe as a sign of a kind of a brave new order. I mean, I'm, I'll speak less about Europe, which right. I, yeah, I feel yeah. less, but about the United States. That's what Trump promised was to kind of mix this, mix it up in this kind of white economic nationalist sort of way. He's delivered somewhat on the white nationalism, although it's telling that he hasn't been able to get a single immigration bill through Congress. I mean, back during the shutdown, there was a whole series of compromises that were, you know, voted on. And his bill, the Trump bill, the, uh, the Miller bill, yes. Stephen Miller, yes. you know, right. got the least a number of votes. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I, I agree with you about the center left. I mean, that's true. And we're sort of seeing that here in, a, in, in the United States as well. What it means for the future, I, I can't answer, but I don't think it means, at least in this country, that the right has the purchase on that. And I think that's what they're really scrambling to deal with. You know, they know how to do one thing right. well, which is to cut taxes. <laughs> so um, it is yeah. hilarious, actually, that like it was like that was it's the other part of like the funny riff about George W. Bush, right, where it's like. Yeah, like this is what they do. Yeah. It's all this is what they got. Yeah. This is what they got. What do you want? You want some tax cuts? Yeah. So you have that problem of how do you transform that kind of a party into an economic populist party? It's very difficult to do. Now, it could be spelled the end of the Republican Party. I mean, I, I don't know about that. I think absent a kind of left movement of the sorts that we saw in the past, 
you know, and I, I think it's really important to, and in, whether it was the French Revolution, the abolitionist movement, the labor movement, or the black freedom struggle, you know, we, we don't have that kind of movement yet. We see inklings of yeah. it all over the place. And in fact, one of the things that would come up at Trump rallies is people would talk about Black Lives Matter a lot. Yeah. Um, Michelle Goldberg has this great line where she's like, people at Trump rallies never talk to me about trade, but they did talk about political correctness. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like, they knew why they were there, Yeah, what they were saying by being there and why they're invested. It was not NAFTA. Yeah. I mean, and Lauren Berl- Berlant, who's a scholar at the University of Chicago, she had a great piece uh, in the New Inquiry about how political correctness really was, how important that was. But I think that tells you something also about the limitations and the weaknesses. You can't build a whole political movement around what's going on in the Ivy League. I mean, it's nice. It's it's good. You know, I mean, you whatever. can build an entire op-ed page around what's going on in the <laughs> Ivy League. <laughs> not, not, not really, though. Look what's happening to Breitbart. They're they're right. they're, they're crashing and burning. I mean, it know? was it, it, we we would joke about this the, the early days of uh, uh, of a the show that's on at eight o'clock on uh, Trump TV. They would, they, we would, we would do, you know, the news that day, and we'd, look, you know, I'd say in the control room, "What are they doing over there?" And be like, "Yeah, he's got some nineteen-year-old from Kenyan who burned a flag on. He's just <laughs> completely owning him." Like, and it's like, like no, I mean, that's like not even an exaggeration. Like, literally, be- a freshman who burned a flag I would be it. the lead of the show. I believe it. And it's like, there's lots of stuff happening out there in the but, big but, bad world. But but the, here's the here's the thing about that. It's I mean it's it's funny, but it also like Ronald Reagan spent a lot of time talking about students at UC Berkeley, right? He, yeah. He, he oh, did. that was right. But but he could connect that to a whole <laughs> crisis of a global authority. communism and right. Well, not not just that, but it was just this is the welfare state. This right. these are people who are products of the welfare state who have right. lived fat, you know, off the fat of the land and who have gotten every benefit our society could give them. And so what are we going to do? We're going to clamp down on education but we're going to cut taxes. I mean, it was right, a whole... Right, right, it, it was He had a, a project. It was a project, and this was a, a, an emblematic story in a project. Now it's just a story. That's right, and and the project has become liberal tears and poning the libs, and and that's the sum total of the project. So you get, what you get is you get this this real ideological bankruptcy, which is which is what one thing that I, I find fascinating is in the weird tendencies of our times... That's the people that are the most likely to be the never Trumpers are the neocons. You mm-hmm. notice this? It's yeah. a really interesting thing. So like Jennifer Rubin, who is a very uh, neoconish person who I, I think her politics have actually substantively changed quite a bit. Yeah. She's not just a never Trumper, but she's changed quite a bit in her views. Um, Bill Kristol, Max Boot, the people that were the neocons, they're the ones who, who tend to find Trump the most odious. And I wonder, like, why is that? What's the sort of ideological continuity there? Well, you know, neoconservatism was the last sort of serious gasp of conservatism. And what's interesting is that, I mean, in my reading of neoconservatism, as it became a project in the 90s and the aughts, not in its original 60s right. and 70s version. Um, the, but, the first generation crystal, et cetera. <laughs> right. right. Um, but, you know, their fixation on imperial war and uh, American standing, the project for a new American century, it was all about the crisis of capitalism, that they felt like American capitalist society post-Cold War was a decadent society, that we have produced a society. And you see this in Brooks. You see this in all of these guys. It's very clear and it's very powerful. One place you really see this is in late 90s literature. Oh, yeah, you know, It's absolutely. incredibly acute in late 90s literature, which I know for an essay I wrote about sort of the war on terror and uh, World War II nostalgia, because it, it manifests yeah. itself in that all that World War II nostalgia you see in the late 1990s is Saving like, Private Ryan, it's yeah. all about like that. We don't, what are we doing here? Yeah. We got an impeachment over a consensual right. sexual affair. And, and we're, what are we doing? Wait, right. we, we used to be involved in a civilizational struggle yeah. against the communists or the, again, the Nazis. And now what we have pets.com. What, what, what's the point of this whole thing? Irving Kristol, before he died, I interviewed him. And he said, look at this Republican Party. This was just after the 2000 RNC convention. There they are arguing about prescription drugs. Give them the goddamn drugs, he said. Just give it to them. (laughs) This isn't – he literally said this to me. This isn't Athens. This isn't Rome. So right. it was the sense that we were supposed to produce this great civilization. And instead we were quibbling over Medicare Part D. Yeah. 
And then and then after 9-11, you know, David Brooks said, you know, in the 90s, what were we talking about? We were talking about Bill Clinton. We were talking about well, how we we're going to redesign our sinks. I mean, the contempt they have for yeah. the kind of the culture of capitalism is very, very strong. And for them, imperial warfare was the answer. And so in a way, Trump to them is the essence of of, of a lot of what of they, that decadence, the decadence. Yeah, he that's is a great decadence. point. The, the the other thing I wanted to ask you about, there's a kind of interesting inversion right now, I feel, where, you know, usually I, I, I've been in different parts of the political spectrum at different parts of my career and, 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 and have been around people with different politics. And generally, you know, the more sort of further you get towards sort of the radical parts of that spectrum, the more savage people are, the more grandiose their their rhetoric about the status quo is mm. um and the more you move towards the center the kind of let you know oh well, we and there's a kind of inversion i feel like with trump mm. interesting so that the the people that are kind of mainstream democratic party folks people that voted for hillary clinton have you know are center left that probably self-identify as liberals and the language they use about trump the way they feel about trump is way more this day might be our last yeah. existentially engaged than the people that are further out in, in the political spectrum who are more radical. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I find that inversion really interesting. I mean, the way I would look at it is that I think, uh, at least the people I talk to, I, I, I think I'm on that radical end of the left you that, are. You're, that you're talking about. And the people that <laughs> I talk to, um, I think we see the crisis as much more systemic and right. deeply rooted and also see much more of an opportunity here. Um, you know, I said this from the beginning of when Trump got the nomination that, you know, this was an opportunity. Uh, I didn't believe it was going to happen because I didn't see it in the Clinton campaign at all. But it's an opportunity to, to engage in the kind of talk of realignment. People should go back to the kind of the, the speeches that Abraham Lincoln gave in 1860. Likewise, FDR. Likewise, Reagan. Poor Jimmy Carter, right? Jimmy Carter actually came in to like kind of bury the New Deal. And Reagan says, no, he's the caretaker of the New Deal. And he, he, he doesn't just run against Jimmy Carter. And he doesn't just run against the Democratic Party. He runs against the entire liberal Project. welfare state. And the problem I see with the uh, fixation on Trump is that it just misses the target. I mean, think of what a different mm. kind of political language could do. This is a guy who his real claim to power. What is this? I'm a businessman. If we had a left that said this is this is what they've been promising to us for 40 years. We're going to run America like a business. Now we are. And look at what it is. It's time to destroy this order that that he is. The, the culmination of. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the culmination of the caretaker of. Right. And instead, I think what I see in a lot of sort of more center left, you know, is just get rid of him. And, and what? Go back to what? I'm not against emotional. I mean, look, Trump is nauseating. I get it. Like, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, think, oh, it's not more of the same. But this could be an opportunity to see in that something much, much deeper and a much more profound crisis. We could be here in 10 years time and it would just be the same back and forth of this kind of awful 50 50 tug of war. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and, and I see this, you know, people say all we need to do in the Democrats is is get those voters in Pennsylvania and this, that and the other. And it's like, OK, we could do that. But in four years, we'll be right back to where we are. You know, we need a different kind of language. Corey Robin is a professor of political science at Brooklyn College. He uh, is the author of The Reactionary Mind from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump, which was originally The Reactionary Mind from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin, which was very cheeky at the time. And then Donald Trump came along to supplant uh, Sarah Palin at the end of that. Uh, this was fantastic, Corey. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Sarah. Why Is This Happening? is presented by MSNBC and NBC News Think, produced by the All In Team with music by Eddie Cooper.